Well, thanks to Elsa and Tom for the invitation to speak today. And thanks to these collaborators and assistants on the two projects that I'll talk about today. So as Tom mentioned in the first talk of the day, mycologists have been doing barcoding for a long time, long before it was cool. And for, mostly for this reason, um, because they're cryptic over the majority of their life cycle and they have a lot of life cycle diversity. Um, still, there's a lot we don't know largely because of that, uh, that cryptic life cycle and diversity of life stages. We don't exactly know what those life cycles are in a lot of cases when something is switching from an endophytic to a pathogenic or saprophytic mode. Um, we don't know the host ranges of most species, the geographic ranges or bio biogeography, or the community ecology of most species. So there's a lot of work to do. And, and as we all know, sequences are, are essential to, that, to those endeavors. Um, so we could say that DNA barcoding is a useful tool for that. But as has been demonstrated in several occasions today, if we don't have those databases of well-identified specimens to draw upon, the inferences that we're going to make from those sequence comparisons are either going to be impossible or simply wrong. So environmental sequencing has added a lot of numbers, a large number of insufficiently identified sequences. This is a graph from David Hibbett's paper in, in 2011 showing the black bars environmental species. So in some years, over 40% of the sequence uh, additions to GenBank for ITS sequences are coming from environmental sequences, not specimen-based sequences. And if we count the, the 454 studies and other high-throughput sequencing studies, that is probably, probably above 90%, I would guess, or at least very, very high. Um, a couple causes for this. One is that many identified species haven't been sequenced yet. Um, also from, from David's paper, the black bars show new species that have been described from 2000 to 2009 that have a sequence for any locus in GenBank. So we see that most sequences, most taxa that have been described during that nine year period don't have sequences in GenBank. So there are a lot of things that we know that we don't have sequences for, and then a lot of those environmental sequences are unknown taxa. Um, here's an example from some work that we did in Morea, a small island uh, close to Tahiti in French Polynesia. And what we found here is that when we compared our sequences to GenBank, this red line is the canonical 97% uh, sequence similarity cutoff, if you'll indulge me for a moment and think of that as a, as a species or a speciesoid entity. Um, most of our sequences, 62%, uh, in fact, were from sporocarp sequences were not 97% similar. They were less than 97% similar to anything in GenBank. And 23% of our sequences exhibit a best match to an environmental sequence. So when we go out and we sequence things found in ATBIs, we're really <coughs> enabling the, the uh, we're certainly expanding the database and we're enabling identification of environmental sequences. But we don't necessarily have to. Just having that sequence can be useful. For instance, the Jones et al. paper on cryptomycota used sequences to build sequence-specific probes that they then probed environmental samples for until they found the critter that, uh, that was attached to that sequence. So the, having the sequence helped them find the organism. And then uh, Nielsen et al.'s study in cladistics looked at what happens if you take ITS sequences, these unidentified things that when we're doing taxonomic studies, we usually leave aside because we can't put a name on them. They put them into the tree and it really changed the topology of the things that they were looking at. So these sequences, even if we don't know what they are, they're useful. And naming sequence OTUs, also in that paper that uh, David and his lab group wrote, suggested a couple different protocols for naming environmental sequences, having some sort of language that we can use to talk about them. So I would say that we have two charges here in a, a floristic project. One is sequencing the known taxa, the taxa that we know. And the other is gaining a biological understanding for those sequences that don't yet or may never correspond to a known taxon. So learning things like community ecology and sequence-generated odd ecology studies and phylogenetic understanding just based on the sequences, even if we don't know what the organism is. So I'm going to talk about some of, the, some of the challenges and some of the solutions that we've come up with uh, working in Mateo's lab on two large-scale sequencing projects. Although uh, 
maybe uh, some of the projects that people have talked about today could also be considered large scale as well. Uh, one is barcoding the Venice Museum of Natural History's fungal collection in which we attempted to sequence about 5,000 specimens from that herbarium. We ended up with about 1,100 uh, good bi-directional sequences and some single-stranded ones in the end. And then the Morea Biocode project that ATBI in, in Morea, French Polynesia, where we've um, sampled about 4,000 samples, including leaf samples for endophytes, um, soil samples, air samples, sporocarps, so pretty much anything we could get our hands on. So these are the four questions that were posed to me. Ron, I lucked out. They only gave me four. Um, maybe they trust uh, your ability for brevity a bit more than mine. So these are the four. How can we streamline the sequencing process? How we, can we streamline and address issues in data management? How can we improve quality control? And how can we pay for it? So those are the four questions that I'll spend the rest of the talk addressing. So the first of those, streamlining the sequencing project. Uh, the first thing that I'll talk about is rapid extraction techniques. I really find uh, extracting DNA to be arduous. I really don't like it very much at all. And we were using a typical CTAB extraction kit with a gene clean cleanup, which was taking us about five hours to run 24 samples. And so I started looking at, with a couple of people from the lab, um, different kinds of rapid extraction techniques. Um, one, an extremely simple sodium hydroxide extraction. You put your sample with, uh, with concentrated sodium hydroxide, mix it up a little bit, take out an aliquot and dilute it in uh, Tris HCl. It takes about um, less than a minute per sample. And it works for most applications, not only ITS, but also um, that, should, that should say single copy microsatellites. And rapid one-step one extraction, which takes a little bit longer, maybe an, maybe an hour for a batch of sequences, um, which works better on leaf detection. So when you're looking at a pathogen like P. remorum that has low amounts in a kind of uh, recalcitrant leaf chemistry. So rapid extractions still work. They're viable for at least three years. Vi viability was a concern, but it turned out not to be so bad, the frozen diluted extracts. We've tested for three years. We haven't gone beyond that. They probably last longer. And uh, perhaps most importantly is they improved sequence success from contaminated sporocarps. So when we were getting bad sequences on sporocarps, these, this NaOH extraction tended to work better, probably because it's very low yield. So you're getting the, uh, the mushroom and not the contaminating DNA. So, so that technique has really changed the way that we've, we've done work in the lab. And it's cheap. It's extremely cheap. Pennies per sample. Another way that we can streamline the sequencing project for a, for a large microflora project are to do a little triage as a community. What are our priorities? If we're, if we're sequencing, the, I would say that the current state of balkanization in sequencing is, uh, is probably doing more harm than good in a sense. If we got together and figured out what these samples are, what are the most important things for the microflora, we would be saving ourselves a lot of time and effort and money. And the other, as Tom mentioned this morning, are, are centralized sequencing facilities where we can reduce costs, use uniform methodologies, have high throughput, and centralize data management. So, so this, this would be a really important advance if we could get that going. So high throughput sequencing me methodologies are going to streamline the process. Um, right now, while they're limited by read lengths and the number of multiplex tags that you can put in a reaction, this is changing very fast. For instance, the new ABI technology, the ion torrent, their smallest chip costs $99, which is about half the price of a Sanger sequencing plate. So the question then is how many specimens we can fit on it. One of those chips can generate uh, over 5 million sequences. So it's a matter of tagging our multiplex tags so we can get a lot of, sequen a lot of uh, samples on those chips. So how many specimens can we fit on it? And it's really nice that we have this uh, ITS barcode accepted, but I think it's going to be very short-lived, <laughs> extremely short-lived. I would guess that within the next five years, we're not going to be doing single locus barcoding because you can run something like an ion torrent. And how many genes do you want to barcode with will be the question, how about all of them? Why not? So that's going to streamline the process. Um, mini barcodes, we've found working on the Venice project that if we took groups of samples that did not s amplify well, we got almost universal uh, success in amplification and sequencing if we just amplified ITS-1. And this 
graph here shows correlations in, in our species identifications based on similarity matrices between the complete ITS sequence and ITS1. It's not a perfect correlation, but it's not bad either. And it certainly is increasing the rate of success. So I think a lot of these old type collections, probably just by trying to amplify the spacers separately, we're going to have a lot more luck. So I definitely recommend doing that. And then volunteer lab help has really streamlined. Um, people from local mushroom clubs, students, um, that has worked out really well for us. I've had a series of volunteers. It demystifies the DNA process for them, and we get some volunteer lab help. So that's been a really important part of our formula in getting some of these sequences done. So the second question then, how can we streamline and address issues in data management? And for data management, I would consider there to be two components. One is the management of the sequence data. And in the Venice project, we used a very brute force approach to content editing, blast verifying our sequences, et cetera. It took, a, it took about four years to get, uh, to get those 1,100 sequences. Um, we did automate the submission process using the table two ASN utility that GenBank provides, along with um, some Perl scripts that I can contributed to build the feature annotation tables for those sequences. So when you can automate, it's going to streamline the process quite a lot. Um, now the Morea Biocode project has worked closely with the developers of Genius Software to build the Morea Biocode workbench, which is freely available. Um, and uh, Genius, the basic edition, will run that piece of software, which allows you to track your lab workflows. So it's kind of like an electronic lab notebook and then run batch blast searches. They're pretty slow, um, as is the program as a whole. Um, it has an extremely large memory footprint, but it's very powerful. And so these are the things that I think can be automated in terms of sequence data management. First of all, the feature annotation tables, as we've shown, can be done with the Venice project. Um, certainly error checking and contig assembly, people that are doing pyro sequencing don't manually correct all their sequences. With a Sanger sequence, we should be able to weed out the very good sequences as well pretty easily. Uh, blast verification should be able to be automated if we use, if we input a GenBank, a GenBank taxonomy into our searches, automate those searches. So anything that is close doesn't have to be looked at manually. We can just, uh, just kick it out as a good sequence. Um, sequence submission can be can be automated, and that's one thing that the Moreo Biocode Workbench is working with as well. And then taxon naming. If we can draw upon a taxon naming scheme so that before we make the submissions, we're getting the taxon names right. Um, this, probably the worst part of this project for me has been the back and forth with GenBank. Oh, did you mean this taxon? This is a synonym of that. Um, partly because when, when I sent those sequences off, I wanted to be done with that project, and it keeps coming back over and over again. So when you submit those sequences, they're going to stay with you for a very long time with this, with this back and forth. So if you can get those names right in the first place, um, you're going to save yourself a lot of pain down the road. The other data component are the metadata that come with the sequences. So for the Venice project, we also took a brute force approach and did the source annotations by hand. Um, now the Morea Biocode Workbench combines a field information management system with a lab information management system. So all of your field data are input as Excel spreadsheets. So you can go out in the field, put everything in Excel spreadsheets, bring them back, import them into Genius, combine them with your lab information up to and including the sequences, and combine them into an automated GenBank submission so it can generate the flat files for you. So a lot of these tasks that are really arduous, if you do them by hand, if you let computers do them for you, you are uh, you're in good shape. And on the topic of met metadata, certainly more go into more can go into a GenBank record than you usually see. Things like uh, uh, things like um, collection data don't often uh, end up in their ecology information, voucher info, geographic info, don't make it into the GenBank uh, submissions all the time. But there are a lot of types of information that would not make it anyway. Um, taxonomic information at the level that you can link to, if you link to something like Mycobank or Index Fungorum, range information that you could get from GBIF or Mushroom Observer, photographs, rarity and conservation status, identification keys, all those things that could be linked to a sequence record. 
Um, my father-in-law is the director of information technology at a hospital, and just out of curiosity, I asked him, what are the kind of things, what are the, the skills, the informatics skills that you're looking for in people that you hire? And what he said the most important thing that they were looking for now was, were people that could program linking programs that take the output from one machine or one process and link it to something else. And so the output of one program being converted to the input of another, something uh, I refer to as data permaculture, it's uh, sort of what's uh, the goal of permaculture, the output of one process is the input of the next. You can do that with data, and as John pointed out this morning, a lot of that work can be and already is being done, but the more we can do that, the more powerful our, our information is going to be. Mm -hmm. I, I would be very worried about adding those elements to, I like to see the sequence, what you're calling it, link, and that's it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, there's certainly a, a valid argument. But I think that the end user is probably assuming that that sequence that they're getting from GenBank, I think users are probably making that connection by themselves, getting that geographic information from GBIF and assuming that it's the same thing because it has the same name. So perhaps we're validating that by connecting them. But I think the users already are making those connections. Well, based on the previous talks today, I would be horrified to assume the same thing to any other names. <laughs> <laughs> You'd probably be horrified at, uh, at how, the, how correct the GenBank name is as well. <laughs> so uh, one way in which, which we can do those linkages that we choose to do, I think, is a technology that's already out there, a field guide for the early 21st century, because I think this is going to become obsolete as, uh, as we go toward more electronics. But here's a QR code. Easily put in the print version of a, of a field guide you can take a smartphone app, take a picture of that QR code, and your smartphone's web browser will immediately take you to a web page, which could have updates to that particular information, could link out to a lot of other pages, such as a GenBank record or a MycoBank record. So it's fixed. Within that fixed format, you have something that's dynamic. You've taken this, you've taken this static field guide and turned it into something to into something dynamic that can be changed. A very simple thing to do. You can generate these QR codes on a, on a web program free of charge. So the third question then is how can we improve quality control? And there are a couple of different elements of quality control. The first, the lab level quality control, chimeras and contaminants, et cetera, I'm not going to talk about. Um, I think we, we probably, everybody who works in the lab knows the issues involved with that. But I wanted to talk about the taxonomic quality control, which, which I think was what Elsa and Tom were getting at um, by quality control. Is the identification correct? And really, I don't have any easy answers to this question. But I think that the process is it has to be iterative and collaborative. Um, for instance, uh, with the Venice project, we sent some sequences to Elsa, who ran a phylogeny, found that most of the names were wrong, fed those names back to us, and the next step should be for us, we haven't done that yet, admittedly, but the next step should be for us to feed that information back to the herbarium. We did include that, those, that information as notes in the GenBank field, but the next step would be to go to the herbarium and say, hey, change these labels on these names. So it, it has to be iterative, it has to be collaborative. And if you collaborate with taxonomic specialists who feed you samples or are working on taxonomic works, important specimens get sequenced, they're well identified, and sometimes you get extra lab help. Um, Roy Holling and David Hibbett have a, have a collaboration going on Bolitz where Roy's contributing the taxonomic expertise, <coughs> David and his lab are contributing the molecular expertise, and it's working very well. And I've had a few master students, one from Kathy Cripp's lab, and then two from Dennis Desjardins' lab, as well as Douglas Smith, who's a, a local amateur mycologist, have come into the lab. And for the price of a dozen sequences that they're interested in, we get lab help over the course of several months. They'll help us out with other projects. So it's, it pays off quite well. And I think we're making an important contribution to barcoding important specimens. 
Um, another issue are third-party annotations. This is a, a topic that's gotten a lot of, uh, a lot of press. But if a third-party annotation can be made with permission of the sequence author, well, why not add to the sequence submission? This is a sequin a submission window. Why not just add a checkbox that says third-party annotations authorized for this submission? You can say you can give permission straight up, up front, rather than rather than wait for somebody to contact you after the point where you don't want to look at that sequence and you don't want to talk about that sequence anymore. If you can just put that up front, I think that that would be a a powerful tool. And then another thing Elsa and I talked about in relation to the Venice project is to have some sort of formalized note that says name taken from herbarium lab label, specimen not examined, or something like that. So the user knows that this is an herbarium name. It may or may not be correct. This is what the people who identified in the herbarium think, but we have not looked at this specimen. So to, ha to have some sort of notation that, that allows people to understand what the potential quality issues are in the data. It doesn't solve them, but it does give people a little bit of a heads up. And then the final question is, how can we pay for it? And I'll start out by saying that, that I think we have the advantage of less animosity between the taxonomic contingent and the molecular contingent of our, of our field due to the cryptic manifestations of fungi and the paucity of morphological characters. That means that I think the community as a whole, as a whole is recognized for a long time that, se D that DNA sequence data are useful for most of the kinds of work that we're doing. And so then the task then is to, prevent a unified, to present a unified front to make the case for how sequence data are helping all of us as a community, um, to, especially to funders. And the deep hypha model, I think, really provides a, a good model for how the community can come together and do something big by working together. So this is a fence. In conclusion, um, Talk about public goods and the free rider problem. So a, a, a well-theorized area of economics is the, the idea that if you cannot control access to something, it's very hard to get other people to pay for it. It's very hard to commoditize something that you can't control access to. So it allows people to get something for free. Really, in terms of DNA sequence data, some people are spending money getting it, and most of us are getting it for free. So the task then is to identify the end users of fungal biodiversity data. You can't, because you can't control access very easily, you can't demand that people pay for it, but you could certainly ask. And so who uses these data? Taxonomists, ecologists, mushroom clubs, I think, benefit from knowing that, that Helvella lacunosa here is not Helvella lacunosa. Commercial harvesters, land managers, I think everybody, everybody in those in those classes benefits from fungal biodiversity data. So some ways in which we might be able to, to bring about funding, and I haven't tried most of these, so I don't know if they actually work, but just a few ideas. One is to request grant funding for a barcoding component in ecological and taxonomic studies. And a lot of people do this already, but I think it's been shown in several cases that the sequence, the sequence budget does not have to be that big, especially if you're relying on volunteer and student help. Five, ten thousand dollars you can you can do a fair amount of barcoding, especially with emerging high throughput sequencing technologies. DNA sequencing is going to be very, very cheap if you can barcode things on an ion torrent chip. So mushroom clubs, um, there are some examples of mushroom clubs that support student research and, and some supporting research as well. So are the mushroom clubs willing to, willing to kick in a little bit to have specimens that they're interested in, perhaps specimens that individual collectors in those clubs are collecting they would like to have sequenced? And could they provide funding either monetarily or in kind in terms of helping out with lab work and things like that? Publishers of field guides, is sequence, are sequence data a value-added component to a field guide? If so, would the publisher put out $5,000 for a bit of sequencing? I don't know. Probably not. <laughs> but it doesn't hurt to ask, right? <laughs> right. Uh, small grants from parks. For instance, uh, Tom was, was telling me that Point Reyes put out $10,000 for DNA sequencing for the, the work that they were doing there. So 
I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't think that you could squeeze money out of a publisher, but I wouldn't think that you'd be able to squeeze one out of a national park either, and, uh, and somehow Tom managed. So another idea, something that I was looking at as a, as a graduate student a little bit is rent capture on mushroom harvests. So that's a, the classic example of free ridership, people uh, profiting off of, off of public goods. Is there a way to, to control that through permitting or something where some of that money could be funneled into, into research? Again, that's a long shot, but, uh, but certainly I, I don't think we're in a position to, uh, to dismiss any options at this point. And PI research gift funds. So uh, Brandon had mentioned that someone anonymous funded his research. Most researchers now have anonymous or, or have gift, research gift funds set up, often linked from their website, where people can contribute to research that they believe in. So I think the idea is that uh, we should consider who might benefit from these data and ask. We might, we might be surprised at the results. So in conclusion, I think that a, a Mycoflora scale barcode database is a big job, but it can be done if we combine these, these three main elements, methodological advances in sequencing technology, data management, information technology, and bioinformatics. Secondly, if we collaborate between systematists, ecologists, mushroom clubs, knowledgeable amateurs, uh, many of which can run circles around me when it comes to mushroom identification, and bioinformaticians, et cetera and then providing a unified front, a community-wide, deep hypha type unified front for requesting funding and doing the work. Thank you. <laughs>